I was uh, very impressed and, and very jealous of the amount of practical boots on the ground work that they're doing. Thank you, Thomas, for coming and uh, showing us some of the fine work you're doing. I'm Thomas Dan Peters, and I'm one of the co-founders of Copenhagen Atomics. We had this idea back in 2013 that we wanted to create a molten reactor configured as a waste burner. It was important for us that it, if it should have any impact on the world energy production, it needed to be something that could be manufactured on an assembly line really rapidly. Fast technology cycles. But most reactor companies or nuclear companies wants to, de to deliver an entire power plant. But uh, we try not to do that. We would like to just deliver the box out there on the left side and sell the heat. And then other companies should use that heat to produce liquid fuel or ammonia or other chemical factories. There's a lot of different production around the world that uses a lot of energy. And we want to supply that energy to those, those types of uh, industrial systems. And of course, uh, making fresh water and electricity is also an option of, and storage as well. We want to provide the box over there. We want to build it. We want to get it approved. We want to put fuel into it. We want to operate it and we want to take it back for recycling when it's done so that the customer doesn't have to worry about all the nuclear stuff. Most of the nuclear companies, they, they want to build the first of a kind in their own country. And that's perfectly understandable uh, if you want to build a new reactor. But unfortunately, we're from Denmark and it's uh, highly unlikely that we're going to build the first one in Denmark. So we, we looked at the world and said, okay, so it's got to be somewhere else. Where, where can we go? You probably all know that energy production in this world has been growing for more than 100 years. But what's really exciting right now is that in the next three decades, it's going to grow more than it ever did before. So this is an exciting time to be a young startup in, a, in an industry that is just growing like crazy. Um, but you, you notice one thing when you look at these, uh, these charts. This particular one is from British Petroleum, but they're all the same and there are many of them. Um, and you can see here that the OECD countries are flatlining. That means that there's basically no customers there for something new. Where are the customers? Um, and you can see here that I mentioned also over there on the right side that by 2030, 80% of global population is going to be in Asia and Africa. So that's most of human, humanity. <laughs> and, um, and there's 5 billion people in those regions that wants to have just like what we have, refrigerators, air conditioning, running water, you know, all these nice things. And that require a huge amount of energy to build that. And that's, of course, why there's all this growth. It used to be in the nuclear industry that that it was initiated by governments. Whenever we, we wanted to build a new power plant, or it was always initiated by governments, and it was funded by governments. And uh, I don't think that's going to happen outside. If you look at that triangle, China, of course, the government will keep everything under control. But in all the other com uh, countries in Asia and Africa, I believe something new and exciting is going to happen, namely that it's going to be driven by big international companies that need energy. They are going to drive it. Of course, they need to go to the government, wherever it is, and get approval to start a power plant. But the big corporations are going to fund it, and they are going to drive those processes. And that means that our customers are those big companies. In order to understand how fast is this transition going to take place, you have to understand the past. And the, these couple of slides show you where the energy is coming from. Uh, this first slide is from 1990. And you can see that 80% of global energy comes from fossil fuels. There's a little bit of wind and solar, and then 6% nuclear. Every step is five years. It's exactly the same today. So for 30 years, it didn't change much. I don't know if you notice where it changed. There's 1% more wind and solar, and then some of the other ones also changed by 1%. So now, of course, that begs the question, how do you think that pie is going to look in 10 years from now, in 2030? <laughs> Exactly the same. Maybe 1% more wind and solar. But that's what we're looking at. And that's as close as you get to facts about the energy future. Uh, so a lot of people ask me, what about nuclear? Couldn't we pro provide, there's 5% there in 2016. Couldn't we provide 10% by 2030? And of course, if you look at the math and the physics, of course we can do that, from, like from a technical point of view. But from a society point of view, the investors, the politicians, the local people that are going to have the, the nuclear power, power plant as their next door neighbor, and all the politicians about getting fuel to those power plants and enrichment and all that, 
I don't find that likely that it's going to grow by 5%, even though it would be possible. Um, then people ask me, what about molten salt reactors? How much energy can we supply from molten salt reactors? And as John said this morning, we've been at it for 10 years now, and we haven't even started one reactor. You know, I don't see us providing 5% in 10 years from now. There is a small chance, though. It's not entirely impossible, but it's gotta, we've got to work harder than we've done so far. If you look at how the mobile phone is different today from the first mobile phones, or how the first airplane was different from the airplanes we have today, or how the first car is very different from the cars we have today, what do you think about molten salt reactors? Do you think they're going to look the same year over year? No. They're going to change, and that's going to be apparent right from the start, when you start building something. Already when you're one month into it, you would stumble upon something that you would have done differently if you had just known this thing. <laughs> and those uh, things are going to come along and you're going to, well, make experience as you go. And uh, we know these kind of public projects where things doesn't really keep to the timeline and it, they take a little bit longer and you have to make changes. You have to go back to the approval process and get something new approved because you had to make some changes. We want to build stuff and test stuff, because the, what's really, really great about molten salt reactors is that it's something that a startup can build. And you can actually do a lot of these things, as long as you don't work with radioactive salts, you can do a lot of these things in your lab at fairly low cost. And that's what we are doing, basically. We are building stuff in the lab, testing it, breaking it, figuring out what didn't work or what should be improved try to improve it in the next cycle, and do the same over and over again. And then eventually we get to a point where we think, now, now this stuff is working, now we want to get the approval. And that's also going to be expensive for us and take a lot of time. But what we hope is that somebody else has already spent a lot of money on educating the, the authorities and the approval agencies about uh, you know, what it takes to get a molten salt reactor approved. So hopefully we can do that a little bit faster. We also already, by then, we have a, a fully working prototype in our lab. So if the regulator asks us, you know, what happens if we change the pressure or the temperature or something, we can actually go to the lab and, you know, change the temperature or drill a hole somewhere, see what happens. So that, that creates a lot more confidence for, for an um, approval agency. Anyway, so then eventually we hope we also get an approval and we can build it because we've already built many and because we already have a supply chain then that can probably go a little bit faster, we hope. So that's just to tell you what, that we chose a different route and a little bit of why we chose it. Um, now I'm going to skip over and tell you more about what is it that we're building in our lab right now, or through the last couple of years. Um, so one of our favorite tools, and I think also if you want to be a reactor, molten salt reactor builder, it will become one of your favorite tools because I know back when they did the, did the MSRE, they had more than 100 loops. And a loop is basically just because a molten salt reactor is something where you circulate a salt inside some kind of loop. You have a pump, you have a heat exchanger, you have some valves, you have a container of some sort, or you have a core, something simulating a core, and then you can test things in there. But if you only want to test a valve, or if you only want to test some measurement equipment, you don't need a reactor that is you know, super big. You can make a small loop, and circulate the right type of salt at the right temperature, and then you can test your valve or whatever it is you want to test. So this is what we're building, these types of, of loops, and we've been, built many different of these. And this, what you see here in the pictures is, is our fifth generation test platform. And what's really great about this is that on the third picture there, you can see inside the furnace that that's where we have the test setup. It's something you can easily take out and put another one in with a new setup, a new type of thing you want to test, maybe with a different salt. So you can, get, you can change the setup within days or sometimes even do several tests within the same day. Um, and this, uh, this kind of loop is, uh, is on a Euro pallet size. So you can move it around with a pallet pusher. You can get it into elevators and through most doors into labs. So it's something that is easy but portable. Uh, and if you look over there on the right side uh, through the section view, you can see there are two uh, red lines. There's a red line about, uh, around this uh, box in the middle, which is the tank. So that's because when we want to work with radioactive salts, we need to make sure that if there's a leak or something, we don't get radioactive uh, um, fumes or anything into the lab where people are working around. So we have two barriers of safety. The first barrier is around the loop itself or the circuit where we circulate the salt. 
and we use argon as a cover gas, and then the rest of the machine is also uh, fully airtight, uh, gas tight, and um, and at the bottom there we have a spill tank. So even if there's a if there's a leak uh, somehow from the first circuit, then it will just spill into the spill bucket at the bottom. Uh, so it's easy to clean up and get going again. Then this is one of the other products we have been working on. It's a molten salt pump. The MSRE also had a pump. It was a cantilever type pump with a long shaft. And if you read the document, you can see they had problems with leakage coming out of the pump, uh, gases coming out of the pump at the, at the shaft um, seal. And they also had some problems with foam. But in the reports, they said that they thought it, it was some problems that could be solved, but they never got around to get the funding to actually solve those problems. Um, so we thought in Copenhagen, let's go make atomics, let's, let's go and solve those problems. So that's what we did. And now we have built a pump that is really unique because it doesn't have any uh, seals and it doesn't have any um, connecting surfaces. So there is nowhere inside the salt. So when this, the salt is flowing through the pump, there's nowhere it, that it can leak out. Um, and in addition to that, the, the first generation of these pumps runs on, on uh, standard bearings, um, but we're working on a version now that runs on electromagnetic bearings. That means that all the rotating parts in the middle of the pump is levitating on a magnetic field. And that means that there's, yeah, no, none of the rotating parts are uh, touching the stationary parts, and therefore there's no wear. So this pump can last for more than 10 years inside a reactor. So it's, it's some of these tools that we, they didn't have access to this kind of technology in the 60s, but we have access to it today. The size of the pump is approximately like this, and it's, it's capable of pumping one megawatt of thermal energy. So that gives you an idea of how much, that's basically the same energy as a big uh, wind turbine. The reason why we built it that size is because it's easy to move around, it's easy to take in and out of these setups. Uh, if we had built it this big, you know, we would need a crane and several people to hold it. We also work on salts. What's really important when you work with molten salt is to, to make sure that you have uh, low levels of corrosion and that you understand the, the chemical processes. So uh, we have worked with that for several years and, and set up a whole production facility to clean the salts. First of all, get all the moisture and oxygen out of the salt, uh, and then also uh, either get the impurities out of the salt or in some cases doping the salt with specific impurities if we wanted to test something like played out or sp test specific uh, measurement technologies. We work both with fluoride and chloride and nitrate salts. So even though the, our favorite reactor type is a thermal type reactor where we use fluoride salts, uh, we just happen to also have had some projects where we work with the other types of salt. We also worked on a number of other components such as flanges, uh, gaskets, uh, valves in the middle there, and some electronic components. Uh, which we have built. Copenhagen Atomics really favors openness and collaboration, and we want to encourage everyone to collaborate uh, across borders and universities and private companies like our, our own to kind of push this. A lot of the software that we've made are open source and available on GitHub, and we try to collaborate with people. Uh, we invite PhD students to come to Copenhagen and do some, uh, some of their testing or uh, uh, experiments on our systems. The things we focus on is these molten salt test systems. Basically, uh, first of all, we work on systems with non-radioactive salts, but right now we're applying for, uh, for working, doing tests with real uh, radioactive salts. I'll get back to that on the next slides. Uh, then we also work on system for cleaning up the salt and handling salt chemistry. And finally, we do a lot of software for simulation and for automating all the tests that we are running. People uh, sometimes ask me, how can we support this work that you do? Later this year, we're going to have an investment round where we allow people to invest in Copenhagen Atomics. So if you might be interested in that, uh, send an email to invest at copenhagenatomics.com. Then you will receive more information about what's going to happen and be invited to demos and other things. I want you to remember that Copenhagen Atomics, we are different. We, we definitely don't want to do the same mistakes that the old nuclear industry does, where they spend millions of dollars on documents and meetings. We want to build stuff and make sure it works. So this is what we're doing, and we're trying to change what is possible uh, in this world. We're trying to get these loops that we run testing all the time, one of them up and running for one year, nonstop, without any failures, 
Uh, and that seems to be uh, quite a challenge to do that. <laughs> so we still haven't done that. So that's one of our next big milestones to actually finish those 9,000 hours of continuous operation. We are hiring mostly technicians and engineers, uh, but also people with a commercial background. Um, especially we're looking for uh, people with, uh, with actual experience in the lab working with fluorine and, and chloride chemistry. We have an application right now to get approval to run with a real salt that you would use in a reactor. It's a lithium fluoride, thorium fluoride salt. So it is a radioactive salt, but of course you know that thorium is not super radioactive. So, so this is one of the next things we will do as soon as we get that approval. I hope we can start that next year start to run one of these loops with the, with the thorium salt. So then it's starting to uh, really smell of a reactor, even though it's not a reactor, because you have the pump, you have the heat exchanger, you have all the right thing, including the salt, running there in your loop at the right temperature. Of course, you, you have no fission, but you basically have all the other things. Um, and then we're talking to Canadian nuclear labs to do some tests at their facility as well, uh, maybe with uranium salts. Um, that's still to be decided. Uh, right now, we have ordered 10 of these loops because we need to do even more testing. Like I said, uh, at the MSRE, they had 100 loops. We're not there yet, <laughs> but we're definitely moving in that direction. And I think before we have a, uh, an, a reactor online and running, we would probably also have run something like 100 loops. Um, and it takes time to go all that stuff up and running and do all the testing. So that's, that's also one of the things we're working on. And then once we've done all those milestones and getting this uh, uh, new investment round closed that we are working on right now, then next year, or I don't know exactly when we will start, but then we will start to build a non-fission prototype. Um, but whereas you saw Thorcom wants to build like a really big one, uh, we are trying to build a small one, a one megawatt uh, reactor. And it's just going to be a demo reactor. Um, but our long-term goal is still the same as what I showed on the first slide, is to build these 40-foot um, shipping container sized molten salt reactors configured as a waste burner in a way where we can mass manufacture them and get them out and do what they're supposed to produce energy. Thank you to Vince and uh, John for uh, making this uh, conference. Uh, it's really great that we get a chance to uh, connect all of us. Thank you. Thank you. It's great work. Yeah. Um, there's an available acronym for your reactor. It's called the Waste Annihilating Molten Salt Reactor. <laughs> I think WAMSER is available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe if we should oh, grab that chat. Man, I love that. <laughs> I love that name, WAMSER. Luckily for those of us in the States, we have this opportunity to be at this conference, and uh, it's a little closer for us to get here, even those of us from Colorado, than it is for you to come from Europe. Uh, but I know there's some European conferences, too. Could you speak a little bit? about um, what you're seeing in Europe in terms of um, equivalent and similar sort of uh, public displays of information? Uh, well, we have Andreas who is arranging this uh, Thorium Energy World uh, conferences every now and then. Last time there was one in Belgium in Europe, but it's usually around the world. Um, and then there is a group of people in the Netherlands who have been, uh, who have had a number of events. There was a uh, well, there was one event, but it was not really this, the same group, but it was still in the Netherlands back in June this year uh, because uh, of the European Union's uh, support um, a molten salt reactor uh, research program. And they had finished the, like the first round and they had a, like a whole day where they explained what they had done. So there was a couple of hundred people there talking about that or a meeting and networking. Um, and then there's sometimes a few events in France. I haven't been to the last couple of events in France, so I can't, cannot speak too much about that. But a few things is going on, um, but not enough. <laughs> hey, Thomas. So um, I know you're planning to use spent fuel as your, um, as, you know, as your fuel. It depends a little bit on what you're allowed to do in whatever country you want to start. So that, that's like thing number one you want to observe. But what I would really like to do is to take out all the uranium and take out all the fission products from the spent nuclear fuel and then take the rest, which is basically, basically the long-lived actinides, put all of that into the reactor as kickstarter fuel and then run it with thorium or lithium fluoride, thorium fluoride yes. As in, in the thermal spectrum. 
Yeah, the, the plutonium in the spent nuclear fuel, plutonium-239. Ed Pyle from Elysium. Yes. Um, the uh, magnetic bearings, right? When you shift from the, magnet, from the motor to the magnetic bearings, you still form a close-fitting uh, structure that forms. So you still have um, fuel salt vapors coming up into the magnetic bearing part that is similar to the rest. How do you um, get around that, that uh, <laughs> vapor deposition, it, even in the magnetic bearing? Uh, I cannot say too much about that, but I can tell you the whole pump is 700 degrees. The BP slide that you put up, I think they terribly underestimate the energy requirements in Africa. I think Africa is going to grow tremendously. But my question for you is, in your 50 megawatt reactor, is that going to be essentially a nuclear battery where it's hands off, runs by itself, or do you expect to have a control room and people manning it? it again, it depends on the country and if you're allowed to run it autonomously. Um, but we already have the loops running during the night autonomously, so no need for a control room there. Uh, and I think that we're in the 20th century, we sh or 21st, we should be able to run those uh, autonomously. Um, but it's a big question if we will be allowed to do that. As you know, uh, molten reactors are walk away safe, so, I mean, I don't see why. I've been to a nu nuclear reactor, old nuclear reactors, where you have like these control rules with uh, more than a thousand knobs and <laughs> handles you can, you can turn, and you have some people in there, and when I look at them, I don't know if I trust them. I, you know, I, I would really prefer that they don't touch all those buttons. <laughs> and especially, I mean, especially if some alarm is going on and you know, they just got a phone call from their wife saying, you have to get home, and, you, know, you don't know what, what knob they're gonna turn. So uh, I would actually be more, uh, uh, safe about having a computer operated, uh, this type of walk away safe reactors. Yeah. So the pump with no seals. Yeah, that was my question. Is, is the rotor immersed in the salt? Yeah. Um, just. Um, so the, uh, the, the autonomous operation of the reactor and does that offer advantages for anti-proliferation aspects of the technology? Keep people out of it? Yeah, you can tell when somebody's been in it? Well, I think no matter if you have people in a control room or not, a modern reactor you should have, you should measure all the time what happens so that you have data to prove if somebody has tampered with anything. And we heard a little bit earlier today about some of the things you can do to detect uh, plutonium in the reactor or other things. Uh, we have this uh, equipment we're working on called LIPS, which is a, a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy system where you can measure the, the chemical composition of your salt. So if you sample that, it, with that type of technology, you can sample every second, and you can upload to some server in IAEA or some other place far away your exact uh, uh, salt composition all the time throughout the entire history of the reactor. And that, can tell you whether somebody has tampered with it, whether they have put something in a blanket somewhere. or uh, so, so we need these kind of technologies to make it uh, safe, I think, no matter if there's people or not. Very good. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for having us. Thanks, and we'll take your mic and give it to